Thank you for joining us today. We will begin soon. Thank you all for joining us. Please enjoy the event. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Zuckerman, president of the Century Foundation. NYU Wagner School Dean Sherry Gleed and I are pleased you could join us today. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Please note that this event is being recorded and live streamed. If you would like to submit a question for our panelists, please do so by using the chat feature. For those of you who are not familiar with the Century Foundation, we're a progressive think tank that pursues economic, racial, gender, and disability equity in education, healthcare, and the economy, including economic security and retirement. Today, we are focusing in on what is arguably the most critical pillar of retirement security, the Social Security program, and discussing how to ensure the program's benefits are there for coming generations, including many of you, the students of NYU. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Kilolo Kijakazi, Acting Commissioner of the Social Security Administration. Dr. Kijakazi has conducted research on and written extensively about retirement policy, systematic barriers, and economic security. Prior to joining the Social Security Administration, she was a fellow at the Urban Institute. She developed collaborative partnerships to expand and strengthen Urban's research agenda and to effectively communicate findings to diverse audiences. Before joining Urban, Dr. Kijakazi was a program officer at the Ford Foundation, where she focused on grant making on building economic security and incorporating the expertise of people of color in all aspects of her work. Finally, she holds a master's of social work from Howard University and a PhD in public policy from George Washington University. Welcome acting commissioner.
Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. I'm Kilolo Kijakazi, Acting Commissioner of the Social Security Administration, or SSA. I am in my home office today in front of my bookcase, and I am wearing a colorful scarf to brighten up a rainy day in Washington, D.C. As a former Brooklyn resident, I'm delighted to speak with the NYU community today. My father graduated from NYU in 1950 with a master's in education, and I'm sure that he would be thrilled that I am participating in this important event with you. I'm also the mother of a Gen Zer. My daughter is currently working on her doctorate in history. And what I say to her and what I want you to know is that Social Security is there for you now and it will be there for you in the future. Social Security is most often thought of as a retirement program and the majority of the 66 million beneficiaries are over 65. However, Social Security is also an insurance program and provides coverage for over 180 million workers and their families. It is an unfortunate fact that roughly one fourth of all 20 year olds will become disabled before reaching full retirement age. And about one eighth of all 20 year olds will die before reaching retirement age. When such tragic events occur, Social Security is there for the worker and their family. For example, if a 30 year old worker who earns a medium wage and has a spouse and two young children becomes disabled, the present value of lifetime benefits would be about $900,000. If the worker died, the amount would be about $880,000. Many people would not be able to afford this amount of disability or life insurance in the private market. Nearly 14 million Social Security beneficiaries are younger than 65, including almost 8 million people who receive disability benefits. And nearly 4 million children receive benefits from disabled, deceased, or retired workers. Social Security will be there for you in the future too, but action should be taken to restore its financial solvency. As Acting Commissioner of SSA, I am a member of the Social Security Board of Trustees. Last month, we released the annual report on the financial status of the Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund and the Disability Insurance Trust Fund. You can think of these as reserves. When the total annual cost of the program exceeds the total annual income, we draw on the reserves to make up the difference. As stated in our latest trustees report, the combined asset reserves of the Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund and Disability Insurance Trust Fund are projected to become depleted in 2034 if no action is taken. This does not mean Social Security benefits would end. There would be sufficient income to pay about 80% of scheduled benefits rather than 100% if no action is taken. However, the trustees recommend that Congress address the projected trust fund shortfalls in a timely fashion to phase in necessary changes gradually. With timely legislative action, as was done in the past, Social Security can continue to protect future generations. So stay informed about your Social Security status. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to go to ssa.gov create a My Social Security account, and check out your Social Security statement online. Your statement contains information about your earnings history, your Social Security payroll tax contributions, and estimates of your future retirement, disability, or survivor's benefits. 
It's been a pleasure talking with you. Uh, hi there. Uh, thank you so much to Acting Commissioner uh, Kijikazi for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dylan Matthews. I'm a senior correspondent at Fox.com, and I will be your moderator for today's panel. Uh, we understand that we have some individuals with site challenges joining us. Uh, so to help set the stage for them, I'd like to ask our speakers, please describe yourself and your setting before you speak uh, so everyone has a little bit more context. Uh, I'm wearing a, a black and gray checkered shirt, and I'm sitting in a gray bench uh, by a gray wall. It's a lot of shades of startup gray uh, here in the Vox offices in DC. Um, before we get started and, and dive into the discussion, um, I'd like to welcome Issa Alamran, who's a lead analyst and national omnibus program director at Data for Progress. Uh, Issa is going to share some statistics to help us frame the conversation. Uh, Issa? Hello, everyone. Issa here. Uh, Dylan, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here talking to you all today, especially as an NYU alum myself. Um, I am currently sitting in my home office in Brooklyn, New York, and I am wearing a button-up Uniqlo shirt in uh, some nice fall colors, I guess, to uh, sync up with uh, some of the fun fall weather we've been experiencing in New York here over the last couple of weeks. Um, but either way, I'm very excited to talk to you all today about some voter attitudes on social security. And with that, let's go to the next slide. Sweet. Um, so before we start, just uh, three points for you all to keep in mind as we go with, through this presentation. Uh, first, the data points that I'll be referencing today uh, come from a survey that was fielded in the end of April and is of 1,200 likely voters at the national level. Uh, second, uh, you'll notice a number of charts in the presentation, but I encourage you to not focus on the numbers specifically, but rather at the big picture patterns that I'll be calling out because I think those paint a much better picture of what we'll be, we'll be talking about today. Um, and third, uh, while it's always important and interesting to talk about different demographics when thinking about social security, today I'll be specifically focusing on age groups. Uh, those voters who are 45 and under and those who are 45 and over, sorry, 40, under 45 and 45 and over. Um, and 45 might seem like an arbitrary number, uh, but it is the median age of voting in presidential elections. And there are some serious behavioral differences between those two groups, uh, especially as it relates to Social Security, as we will see. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so to start us off, uh, we asked uh, in a survey of national voters, uh, to, to see what voters' understanding of social security is like. Uh, we found that nearly three in 10 voters say they have a strong understanding of social security, while around six in 10 say they have a, a basic understanding of the program. However, I'd love to call your attention uh, to the age breakdown at the very bottom of the slide. Uh, as you can see, 29% of voters who are 45 and older say they have a strong understanding of the program compared to 22% of their younger counterparts, a seven point difference. Next slide, please. Uh, we then also provided voters uh, with a number of uh, options that people have been relying on as a source of income in their retirement. And we find that social security tops the list uh, as a source of income that people plan to uh, rely on in their retirement. 56% of voters say they plan to, retire, to rely on social security when they retire. Again, calling your attention to the difference in age groups, uh, older voters, those that are 45 and older, 71% of them say that they plan on relying on Social Security in their retirement. This is 29 points more than voters who are under 45, who say that they will retire, uh, they will rely on Social Security um, at, at 42 points. Uh, so a 29 point difference in polling is, uh, is, is quite large and not something that's common to see, especially as a difference between these two age groups. Uh, so it's a really interesting data point here. Uh, next slide, please. We also asked voters the extent to which uh, they plan on relying on social security benefits um, as a source of income in their retirement. Uh, we find that 27% of voters say they plan to rely on social security as a major source of income, while nearly half of voters say they plan to rely on social security as a minor source of income in their retirement. And again, we notice a difference between these two age groups. By about nine points, older voters um, are more likely to rely on social security as a major source of income when compared to the, their younger counterparts, which is you know, part of this pattern that we see emerging here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, we then ask voters uh, their confidence in whether or not they'll receive full social security benefits when they retire. And we find that overall voters are about split. 50% of them feel confident and 50% of them don't feel so confident. Um, and again, looking at age, we find that um, 25% of older voters feel very confident that they'll be receiving social security benefits when they retire compared to 13% of younger voters, a 12 point difference. Uh, next slide. Um, and so I know that was a lot of slides, a lot of numbers, uh, but there are some key takeaways here that I think are really important to, uh, to focus on. First, social security is a largely popular program uh, with the US electorate. And most voters report having a basic understanding of how the program at works and how the benefits work. Um, second, Social Security maintains a prominent role in voters' retirement plans. However, only about 27% of voters say they plan to rely on the program as a major source of income. And we find that older voters are more likely to rely on the program than younger voters. We also find that older, older voters tend to be more confident in the program than younger voters. Um, and so, you know, putting this all together, there appears to be a consistent pattern of disconnect between younger voters and Social Security, uh, which is very interesting, but I'll leave that to our great panelists to discuss today. Um, thank you all so much. Um, again, um, my name is Isa Lomran, and it's been a pleasure talking to you all today. Thank you so much, Isa. Um, now I'd like to welcome our, our panel. We have three uh, great experts on social security um, from across the spectrum to talk to you today. Um, first is Jason Fickner, who's vice president and chief economist at the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, here in Washington, DC. Um, we also have Tracy Groniger, who's managing director of economic security and housing at Justice in Aging. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, Laura Haltzel, who is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. Um, all of them have extensive experience with social security and I'm, I'm really excited for their thoughts. Um, just so we can frame the conversation, I, I thought we could maybe start by talking about the very, very basics. So here's a very broad question for you all. What is social security? What's, what's essential and what makes social security the program that it is to you? Maybe we could start with you, Laura. Sure, sure. Uh, before I respond to the question, my name is Laura Haltzel. I'm wearing a black jacket over a royal blue blouse in front of a blurred background. Um, so what is Social Security? It is essentially a social insurance program. The insurance element is that it provides a monthly cash benefit that helps to replace earnings lost due to an insured event. In this case, that's the, dis the disability, the death, or the retirement of an insured worker. And workers obtain social security coverage by working in covered positions and contributing to the program through payroll taxes on those earnings. You can think of these as insurance premiums. These show as FICA or the Federal Insurance Contribution Act on your pay stub. The social element is that all covered workers are contributing to the program. About 94% of workers are currently covered by social security. And the program achieves social goals of providing protections, not just for the worker, but for their family and providing a higher level of earnings replacement for lower earners who are less able to save on their own than higher earners. But if you're asking really, what does it do and what does it mean to people? I would say that social security is an essential program for the 94% of Americans that are covered by it. As the acting commissioner mentioned, no one wants to be disabled or to lose a spouse or a parent before their time, but social security can provide income to replace earnings when those workers are lost. Social security provides a floor of support, a foundation for retirement. Although the social security benefits are modest, averaging about $22,000 a year for a retired worker and about $18,000 a year for a disabled worker, because the program is nearly universal, unlike access to private sector pensions or 401k type programs, about 90% of individuals age 65 and older receive a social security benefit. And although the polling shows that people have different expectations about how much they might rely on social security, social security benefits provide a significant source of income for the vast majority of American retirees. 
Actually, Social Security is the largest portion of income for 60% of households that are age 65 and older. And more than half of Americans age 65 and older had no pension income in 2017 in their household. So that's why Social Security is such a critical part of the American infrastructure. Wonderful, thank you so much, Flora. Um, Jason, can you talk to us a little bit, expanding on this, on, on the role of Social Security compared to, to other programs for people who are retired or, or, or disabled? How does it fit in next to things like private pensions, uh, programs like 401ks or, or uh, other defined contribution programs that people might be familiar with from their jobs? Of course, Dylan, thank you. Uh, and first of all, uh, again, I'm Jason Fickner, Vice President Chief Economist at the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm wearing a very handsome blue shirt, uh, light blue with a nice sport coat, also blue. I'm in my office in Washington, DC at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And I do not have my screen blurred because behind me, you can see a little bit of Franklin Square Park and also the Washington Post building, uh, which of course I feel very strongly about the power of the press these days. So I like to have that prominently in my background. Uh, Laura did a very good introduction on what is social security. And I think the acting commissioner also pointed out something very important. And I'll get to your question, Dylan, by highlighting just a few things about the role of social security. A again, it's key to point out that in the title, it is the old age survivors and disability insurance program. It is meant to be insurance. It is kind of morphed into more of a retirement program over the last couple of decades, but originally it was old age insurance. Imagine you go back to the 1930s and depression era. If you were lucky enough to get to 65, most people didn't live longer than a couple of years after 65. They lived to 70 or 72, but they ran out of their income. So it was this old age insurance that replaced earnings. And the other key that Laura mentioned on is this is an earned benefit. You have to work to get the benefit. It is not a welfare program. It is an entitlement program based on an earned benefit based off work. And that's another key distinction of how it differs from other federal and state programs. The contribution and the benefit you get nowadays has been kind of a supplement. So I think for a lot of the Gen Z people today, they're hopefully when they get a job, they're gonna start contributing to their 401k or 403b plan. The difference being is a 403b is for nonprofits or 401k is for profits. But that is gonna be one of the three legs of the old three-legged stool we've talked about, which a three-legged stool is supposed to have social security, personal savings and an employer sponsored plan. Originally, the employer plan was a defined benefit plan. And I think when you start thinking about the concept of a defined benefit plan, people were working and getting a paycheck. And then when they retired, they got another paycheck from the defined, con defined benefit plan. So you're basically getting a paycheck for life. And what we're doing now is looking at the defined contribution plans, these 401k or 403b plans, these defined contributions that we build up assets. People will save over the course of the working years. And then we kind of let them go at retirement. And we don't help them turn that nest egg into a source of income in retirement. So when you start thinking about Social Security as getting sort of your annuity, if you will, Social Security is an inflation-protected annuity that lasts as long as you live. Think about how that would augment your income based off what you're going to get from your defined contribution plan, which has a component of asset growth, and you can turn into income as well. You can do drawdown plans, a 4% rule. You can annuitize. You can do a bridge to help you delay claiming Social Security. There are a lot of things, but I think now for Gen Z, the idea is to think about how do I think about my retirement portfolio holistically? which includes your personal savings you might have on the side, your house, it's gonna include your 401k plan, your defined contribution plan, and also the benefits of social security and how you end up turning that into protected income that allows you to spend and have a comfortable retirement for the rest of your life. Thanks so much, Jason. Tracy, I wanna bring you in here. Um, you you advocate for, for seniors, uh, elder, elder Americans at, at Justice and Aging. Um, how important is, is Social Security as, as part of the, the safety net and, and suite of programs that affect the, the people you're advocating for? It, it seems pretty central, but, but how has it become such a sort of central part of, of their lives and a tool for pursuing a lot of goals we want in terms of making sure we provide a fair economy for people in, in the last years of their life? Yeah, that I mean, Social Security has become just a, such a critical part of American society. I think that most people, most of the people listening here 
have relatives who receive social security. They know, you know, their grandparents have received benefits from social security. Um, it's part of how we ensure as a country that people are aging into what Laura kind of described as this foundation of support, this floor of support um, that also helps improve equity in our society as well. I mean, I think that one of the big things that social security does is makes up for some of the systemic discrimination that takes place over the course of an individual's life. Historically, we know for people of color, for women, people with disabilities, their wages and earnings oftentimes are lower for a variety of reasons. And Social Security does a really important job of trying to balance out some of that inequity by providing a floor of support you know, for people who had lower wages and who maybe didn't make as much over the course of their lives for whatever reason, Social Security provides a greater percentage of income for them. And so it ensures that they're not then forced into a situation where because of that historical discrimination, they then age into really unfortunate circumstances. And so I think it plays such an important role. And it's something that I think, you know, we talk about like the three-legged stool and how that was supposed to work and what has actually happened. And we look at, I think, you know, looking at those charts, people talking about, you know, the over 45 group has maybe some experience in terms of, wow, my retirement portfolio does not look the way I expected it to look. I think I'm going to be relying on social security more than I expected. And so I think that that kind of plays into some of those numbers that we see. And I think, you know, as a society, we have to decide, you know, is this something that, you know, we want to support and make sure continues in a way that is fulfilling what people expect it to do, you know, and how do we do that? And I think that's something, you know, that we all basically agree on that it's it's doing an, it's playing an important role in our lives and as part of our culture and we want to make sure that it continues to do that. Great, thanks so much. Um Laura, just very quickly, um I was wondering if you could I saw you nodding along when Tracy was talking about the three-legged stool. I just wanted to be sure we could define that for for our audience since I think that's a term of art in, in our time and set circles, but it's it's important for thinking about sort of if you're planning your own retirement, if you're thinking about this as a policy. So Social Security is one leg. What are the other two legs and, and how do they fit together? Sure. And and Jason spoke a bit to this as well when he mentioned uh, the three-legged stool. But uh, ideally, it is Social Security. And then there is the pension part that used to be, as Jason pointed out, the defined benefit pension that was what we thought of as the traditional pension, where someone would work their entire lives with perhaps one employer and receive a payment for the rest of their life until they had passed. Um, that now is, of course, the defined contribution plans, which are really the self-funded, self-invested, self-managed, self-withdrawn type of account that is a very different um, structure than your defined benefit plan. So that, that part of the stool isn't as reliable for many as it had been, aside from which, again, the pensions are not universal. They are not um, available to everybody. As I mentioned before, over half of Americans retiring in 2017 did not have this kind of income. Um, the third part of the stool was supposed to be assets and, and things that people had saved independently. Sadly, we are also not performing very well on that front. So right now, our three-legged stool is a pretty unbalanced leg and a half, maybe. Uh, and so that's what I think um, is driving a lot of the discussions these days, because it's why is Social Security so critical? It's because it is right now the strongest universal part of that three-legged stool. And I think I'd, I'd add to that, Dylan, because the joke I usually make when talking about the three-legged stool is it's now turned into a pogo stick. Yeah. And people are trying to hop around and stand up. And to Tracy's point about equity, you, you do have then equity issues, both for racial issues and gender issues, because for many, Social Security does become their primary means of support in retirement. They can't augment with personal savings or a 401k plan. And in some ways, if you're participating in a 401k, then the employer part of the leg and your personal savings part of the leg has become a leg. So now you're on a two-legged stool, and we know how hard it is to try to balance on a two-legged stool. Yeah, not recommended. Um, Tracy, I wanted to bring you back in there just because I think this point on, on racial equity is really important. You mentioned some ways in which 
Social Security can can balance against some historical inequities. But it also this is a program that that was created nearly a hundred years ago uh, through a coalition of FDR and and some segregationist Democrats, frankly. Um, how has the program's record been with regard to racial equity and and what are some of the challenges going forward to make sure it, it stays a, a force for racial equity? I think I forgot to describe myself, so I'm going to do that really quickly and then answer your question. Um, I'm a black woman. I'm wearing a green sweater. I'm in my home office and also in Washington, D.C. area, Tacoma Park, um, on, a, on a rainy day. Um, so to answer your question, um, I think Social Security is very important um, in terms of racial equity. And actually, because of the way that it is a progressive benefit, uh, people of color who are more likely to have lower wages and less in terms of other resources, to Jason's point, depend on it even more. Um, and so they are more likely to receive a higher portion of their benefits through social security than their white counterparts. And so in that way, it's very important to increasing equity and improving equity for people of color. Um, I think that as we look at the way in which Social security is so tied to wages and the jobs that you have, it can then also be inequitable in the sense that the types of jobs that people of color have are less likely to be covered by social security, which means that they then may not have access to benefits. One really long standing one is in caregiving, um, where you see a lot of people who are caregivers, home cleaners, people doing jobs that are more likely to be off the books, so to speak, um, not counted, are not then receiving um, social security benefits when they retire because those wages that they earned were not counted. Um, and so the way that we're looking at you know, jobs and work uh, is difficult in terms of how you then compensate people uh, afterwards for the work that they did. Um, I think a Another thing that is happening now that is affecting people of color and I think people in general is kind of the gig economy um, and more people are doing work that is not necessarily being counted for purposes of social security. And I think we're going to see that having um, a negative effect in terms of people who are doing these jobs that maybe don't pay as much, um, not also getting social security benefits when they retire at the, at the same rate that they would have otherwise. Absolutely. Um... One other equity issue that I wanted to be sure we touched on is, is gender equity and, and social security is tied sort of deeply to marriage. Um, there, uh, um, you, one typically does not get credit for caregiving that is not just off the books, but not part of the economy if you're a, a stay at home mother or father, but uh, given the structure of our society more often mothers. Um, Laura, maybe you could speak a little bit to sort of ways in which the, the current system interacts with gender and, and ways in which it might uh, benefit, but also sort of pose challenges uh, from an equity standpoint, especially with, with the way things like survivor or spousal benefits are set up. Sure. So um, obviously, you know, Tracy has already referred to wage issues, and we know that women in particular are paid, you know, maybe 75 cents, uh, the numbers fluctuate up and down, but 75 cents on the dollar for what a man in the same uh, industry position uh, would earn. Unfortunately, that um, is compounded when you look at caregiving and what's expected when there are children that come into the picture, or if you have a disabled family member, or if you have an aged parent. Most often, although this has been shifting, thank goodness, to, to be a little more balanced, but most often that role has been taken on by women who have stepped out of the workforce in some cases, which we saw during the pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, those years of earnings are lost, not only from a social security perspective, but also from a savings for a pension perspective, as well as a savings outside of those, those two systems perspective. So it's a massive loss of income in the at the immediate moment and over time. And of course, given compound interest, that grows to be very large. Um, so that's 
one area where um, a lot of those uh, concerns about caregiving can come in. There have been discussions in the past about modifying the program to recognize years that people have taken out of the workforce in order to provide these unpaid um, skills and trying to provide a, care, a credit um, that would replace otherwise what show up as zero years for women in their uh, social security benefit won't resolve the pension issue. It won't resolve the ability to not save outside, but it would be at least one lower penalty. And when people talk about, say, increasing the number of years required um, for the benefit formula, this is one of the places that we get concerned because you're then going to punish people who either have disabilities and had time out of the workforce or those women who have taken out for caregiving to an even greater degree if you're adding additional years uh, where they may have had to take time out of that formula. The progressivity obviously helps to um, balance some of that out. But again, it's just the Social Security element. The pension piece and the savings piece are not resolved. So I want to get into some numbers and, and specifically some numbers on, on Gen Z since that's what, what brings us here today. Um, so the first wave of Gen Z taking early retirement is going to start getting checks in, in or around 2060. And we just had a new trustees report uh, that says that by that year, uh, Social Security is projected to be paying out or, or should be paying out if it keeps sort of its current formula uh, much more than it's bringing in in taxes and specifically about 4.2% of taxable payroll. Um, most people don't go around their lives thinking about what taxable payroll is and whether 4.2% is a lot or a little of it. Uh, so Jason, I was going to throw it to you. How big a deficit is that? How, how significant in the history of Social Security or, or in the government is, is a gap that big? Well, it, it's a very large gap, Dylan. Uh, and I think what's important to realize when we did the 1983 reforms the last time, I think that was about three months before the checks were about not ready to go out. We already today have a much larger financial hole than we did in 1983, which also shows why the challenges of doing reform are much difficult. But for, for people in the audience listening to the Social Security part of this, there's basically right now a 12.4% tax up to $160,200 a year of taxable wages that go for Social Security. There's another tax, 2.9, that goes for Medicare. Uh, it's split even between the employer and the employee. So 6.2, we just focus on Social Security for the employer, 6.2 for the employee. But economists assume that all that falls, the burden falls on workers because it comes out of your wages one way or the other. So let's assume it's 12.4%. You mentioned a 4.2 percentage point gap. That means we'd have to raise payroll taxes by 33% up to 16, 17% plus add on Medicare. Now you're basically looking at a 20% payroll tax rate and we're not even solving the, social, the Medicare problem yet, which also has a funding gap. So it's significant. And, and I think one of the things I wanna get out and the acting commissioner mentioned this as well too, you hear a lot of people talking about social security is going bankrupt. That is not correct. Let's just start with that. First of all, it's not going bankrupt. There's always gonna be payroll taxes coming in to pay what's basically the difference between scheduled and most payable benefits. So whether it's 75% or 80%, there's going to be something there. The trust funds are scheduled to go depleted if we don't do anything. I personally can't see Congress letting you know, beneficiaries get a 25% haircut in 2033. But then again, we never thought we'd have Congress go government shutdowns, debt ceiling, fiscal cliff. So we don't have to think about political risk that we have in 2033. But this is the, this is the gap, right? If we're talking about how you make it up. You either got to do a 25% cut in benefits, some way, shape, or form. You have to do a 33% tax increase, some combination of the two, or we got to get a little bit more creative, Dylan, and think about how we get in more revenues into the system besides focusing just on payroll taxes, which is a tax on labor. And as a tax economist, I will tell you what you want to do is you want to subsidize things you support and you tax things you don't support. So if we support work, we probably shouldn't tax it anymore. Very fair, very comprehensive, Jason. I appreciate it. I want to sort of talk a little bit about root causes here. So I, I think a natural question here is how did things get so out of whack? How did we get to a point where uh, taxes are, are four points lower than where they would need to be to pay for the benefits we want for people? Um, Laura, maybe I could, could uh, ping you on this. Um, how did that imbalance come about and, and what's changed in American society such that 
that that imbalance uh, arose? Sure. Um, well, a couple of things I want to point out. Uh, Jason already mentioned that the Social Security payroll tax is um, put onto the first 160200 of earnings under Social Security. Um, he mentioned the Medicare tax. The portion that is contributed to for Medicare is not subject to that same dollar limit. So one of the challenges is, you know, do we consider lifting that cap on taxable wages? Um, and that comes up partly because you talked about 4.2% of taxable payroll. The question is that's, that's taxable payroll under current law. So the payroll tax base, as we know it, um, is already limited at that 160,200. But over time, the payroll tax base has also been eroding. So the portion of all of the earnings in the economy that are subject to payroll taxes have been declining from 90% of earnings back in 1983 to about 82.5% of all earnings now. So this is happening, unfortunately, because of inequity and in, in gro growth of wages between the highest earners and the lowest earners. And so Social Security is essentially losing 8% or so of earnings every year and has been since around the year 2000. Uh, now, unfortunately, eliminating the cap doesn't solve the entire puzzle, but should that be part of the conversation, I think most of us would say, you know, restoring it at least to 90%, which would put it right now at about 300,000 would be, would make sense. Um, the other problem is that the amount of total compensation that is paid out in earnings has also been eroding over time. And that's because benefits such as health insurance um, are taking a greater portion, as we all know, of everybody's paycheck. Um, those, those benefits, the health insurance benefits, in addition to some other types of benefits, such as um, flex spending accounts, say, for um, health costs or for childcare costs, those are not earnings that are subject to the payroll tax. Um, and so the, the portion that we're collecting off of the base has been shrinking. If you, if you covered the health insurance portion of benefits by the payroll tax, that would achieve about 34% of the 75 year gap. Um, if you covered the cafeteria plans and flex savings plans, that's another 10. Uh, so that can go a long way towards fixing the gap between the scheduled benefits and the payable benefits. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece, though, is demographic. And this is the longer term challenge that we're facing. Social Security was set up to be a pay as you go system. And for, for folks who aren't wonks in the Social Security world, um, that means that the contributions of today's workers are funding the benefits of today's retirees. And that works very well as long as there are enough workers and the amount of, of people paying in is fairly equivalent to the people who are receiving. The problem we're having is that we have had a decline in fertility. And as a result, people who are entering the workforce, who are going to then be providing payment to a larger group of social security beneficiaries. So we are, are dealing with a gap in fertility. So over time, the trustees have assumed that we'll return to basically a stable rate of two children born per woman in the United States. But recently it's been as low as 1.6. And so that's part of what's driving our longer term demographic uh, challenge with the uh, aging essentially of the, of the American population. And can I just Thanks highlight so one just really quick. I just want to highlight for everybody listening that we're talking about that gap. Like we're not talking about like social security is gone because I think we get so deep in the wonk that we're like, oh, what are we going to do about that 20% cut? And it feels as you're listening sometimes, like we're talking about everything disappearing and we're not. Like we're trying to make sure that that 100% of benefits stays 100% of benefits. We don't want to see 20% cut or 25% cut. We want it to be at 
100%. So just to clarify, because I even get into it, I'm like, oh no, it's all over. Oh, it's not all over. It's like, we're trying to make sure that everything stays full, fair, 100%. Okay. And I would add to that, because to Tracy and, and Laura's point, the, the cost of delay, like Laura was mentioning the idea of getting rid of the, what's called the taxable maximum, that's that 160200 which goes up every year with an adjustment. When I was, uh, I was the secretary of the board of trustees, so I signed three of these trustees reports that uh, the acting commissioner talked about. Back in the Obama administration, had we just lifted the cap then, that would have solved a 75-year solvency problem. It does not do it today. It gets about 60%. If we wait 10 more years until trust fund depletion, it probably gets you 40%. So there's a cost to the delay. And the reason I bring this up is we're talking about Gen Z. You, you all have to be interested in making reform today. If you don't, the delta gets larger, the cost gets greater the longer we wait. And it's important to consider that. And in Laura mentioned demographics, you know, the baby boomers, we're at a point now where 10,000 people a day are turning age 65. 2024, we hit what we call our peak 65 moment. 12,000 people a day will turn 65. The number of workers coming up behind them aren't as many to support those workers. So the worker to beneficiary ratio is declining. We have to think more holistically about how we increase labor force participation to get more people in the, in the labor market, whether it's immigration, whether it's current workers, women, et cetera. How do we do that to get more workers in for productivity growth and as well as for supporting the program? Thank you so much and, and thank you Tracy, for that that reminder that we're, um, sort of, I think the, the biggest gap is about 25%. And so if you were planning on $20,000 a year in benefits, that's a cut to 15,000. As Jason said, it's hard to imagine Congress going with, along with and across the board, but $15,000 is not nothing. Even so, I'd be pretty mad if that was me. <laughs> Losing $5,000 a year is, is, is pretty significant. Um, and and I think I the last thing I wanted to ask before we go to audience questions, Tracy. Um, one challenge that I, I always try to remember in thinking about this is that we still have a serious senior poverty issue. That despite having this this big program um, that does a lot to alleviate senior poverty, uh, there are some seniors whose savings or social security or and earnings combined is is not enough. Um, how do you address that and how much harder does addressing that make closing the funding gap if you are, are also trying to expand benefits for certain vulnerable groups of people? So I think one thing that people may not realize is that we also have a program um, set up called the Supplemental Security Income Program that is specifically created, it was specifically created to prevent senior poverty and poverty for people with disabilities. And that program has a lot of also work that needs to be done <laughs> to it to actually lift seniors out of poverty. But those, I think, building blocks are in place. Um, if we are committed to the idea of eradicating senior poverty, of making sure that everyone has, you know, the very, very basics that they need, um, that program is a whole nother program run by the Social Security Administration that's really key and critical um, and provides income to people who maybe didn't work here in this country for long enough or they haven't worked or they don't have the credits, you know, they're able to supplement their income using that program, which I could talk about for a long time, but I'm, I know we're not talking about this. So I'm gonna leave it at that SSI, yay. Go to Justice and Aging's webpage if you wanna learn more. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, um, now I'd love, love to open it up uh, for questions. Um, if you uh, are in the YouTube chat, um, feel free to, to drop questions there. Um, and um, I'll be checking there and, and seeing um, uh, what folks think. Um, we had one, one question that was submitted just in registration um, that I, I thought was interesting. Uh, one question was about raising the tax cap, uh, which, which Laura talked about a little bit as one idea. Um, another idea uh, is changing retirement ages. And one person specifically asked if early retirement should be raised to age 65. And I don't know of a, a time when we've ever raised early retirement, but maybe Jason, I can bother you to, to explain what that would mean and, and some of the pros and cons of a policy like that. I think you hit the, the key point, Dylan, there's pros and cons, right? So this is like the best answer in economics is it depends. And so you say, should we raise the retirement age? It depends. Uh, on the one hand, 
for some people, longevity is increasing, right? The point here is for some. So there's an equity issue both for income and for wealth and for the jobs you have. For certain people like that, it might make sense to increase their retirement age because they are living longer than the average age. And in some ways, the program wasn't intended for that. For others, they are not living as long and they are getting less from Social Security. And it might make sense to beef up the bottom a little bit. The way the program works now for everyone who's a Gen Z, the, what's called the full retirement age is age 67. If you claim early, as early as 62, you get a reduced benefit for each year you claim before age 67. So age 62 is actually what I call the minimum benefit age. And to give you an idea, if you were scheduled to get $1,000 a month at age 67, you get 700 a month at age 62. If you delay claiming to age 70, you get what's called the late retirement credits, about 8% a year, meaning that $1,000 at age 67 would be $1,240 or so at age 70. And that benefit would last you the rest of your life and it's inflation protected. So if we raise the retirement, let's say I take 67 and make it now 70. That means the reduction factors to age 62 get greater and the age 62 amount is now less. So for people who are having jobs that are manual labor or they are health issues and they can't work past 62, that means you are putting in a position of getting less when they need it the most. And that becomes problematic. So if we think about the retirement age, we have to think more holistically about how we would basically bend it and change it for those who are higher income versus lower income. And in some ways thinking about the protection factor, maybe having a higher or a minimum age 62 benefit for those who really need it most and can't afford to work longer. And Dylan, if I could just add in there, um, since I think they, they also mentioned the earliest eligibility age um, going up from uh, 62 to 65, um, that actually does nothing for solvency. Um, and so if you're looking to fill the gap between the payable benefits and scheduled benefits, um, just increasing the earliest eligibility age or the minimum benefit age, as, as Jason calls it, um, will, not, will not do anything. You're on mute, Dylan. Oh, thank you, thank you Jason. Um, we, we also got a question about sort of the nitty gritty of how people access benefits. Um, uh, someone mentioned that there's been a lot of delays in, in processing from the Social Security Administration. Um, the administration has seen funding cut a lot in recent decades. Um, what is that? What has that meant for people accessing the program? And uh, are there ways to to address that without sort of adding a huge amount to to the ongoing sort of funding challenge? Maybe Laura, if you had some some thoughts on that. Sure. So I, I, over the last you know, decade or so, and actually Jason can probably even speak to this better because he was, you know, the deputy commissioner at one point. The um, the Social Security Administration has really been underfunded compared to um, what its needs are. As we've had the aging of the baby boom, when we've had more people applying for benefits, at the same time, the real amount that Social Security has received based on an inflation adjusted rate has declined. And so over the last decade, you've seen closures of, of field offices, you've seen reduced hours, overtime has been cut. And so not surprisingly, we've seen delays and frustration from uh, all of the constituents that might be applying for benefits. And we worry particularly about those who require um, you know, timely services if someone uh, has passed, if they need to have a social security number change, uh, things that require in person, um, those were obviously affected by the pandemic. And so there have been a lot of um, struggles over the last decade, um, but I would say clearly fully funding social security to meet the increased demands of the aging population uh, really should be step one. Wonderful, thanks so much, Laura. Um, another question from the audience, um, is preserving social security by simply authorizing the Fed to 100% fund social security benefits feasible, uh, addressing insolvency without a, adjusting the age requirement? So I think there are a few ways to understand this question. Um, one is the Fed as the Federal Reserve, which I feel like is a little outside our, our mandate here. Um, but another is is the idea of just using general revenue. And so maybe Jason, if you can talk about that a little bit since you've you've talked about using something like a carbon tax, what what role can general revenue play in shoring up social security? 
So I, I think this is a great question to ask because we start thinking about what else can you do besides payroll taxes and re reducing benefits. So you have to find other sources. And one is general revenue transfers, which what that means is you borrow money. So realize that right now we have a $31.4 trillion national debt. And if we want to use general revenue transfers, you're putting in $200, $300 billion a year to make up the shortfall. Uh, that could be a likely outcome because Congress has been very good at borrowing money. It's a bipartisan issue. No one likes to raise taxes, no one likes to cut benefits, they'll just borrow more money. But that means you're piling on debt to the next generation. And so again, sort of the plea to the Gen Zers who are listening, this really does impact you. Potentially you could be paying more in taxes, getting less in social security benefits or paying higher interest on the national debt. There is no free lunch here. So the inter the intergovernmental borrowing, general revenue transfers is not a free lunch. It could be a stop gap or it could make up some of the difference if we start thinking about how to do different tweaks along the way, but, but that's what it means. And the other way is thinking more creatively. Why not think about a carbon tax? Again, I mentioned earlier as a tax economist, I like to tax things I don't like and subsidize things I do like. I don't like carbon and anyone else does. Why not do a carbon tax? You also could find things that don't impact behavior that much, but could raise a lot of money. My concern on the payroll tax side is it makes labor more expensive for employers. And if you're worried about AI taking your job, you really don't want to be more expensive to an employer. But we do see a lot of things, and this goes into the progressive side of things. How could you tax wealthier people more? without changing their behavior. And one could be a financial transaction tax. When you go to sell stock right now, if you have an E-Trade account or a Fidelity account and you sell stock, you pay a very, 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 very small percentage. It's like pennies when you sell a stock. You could add that as a financial transaction tax for Social Security. People are still gonna sell stock. They're not gonna notice they sell $10,000 at $1.62 went for Social Security. You could do even more on high volume trading. That could be a really creative way to bring in revenue that doesn't change behavior and doesn't affect the labor markets. And I think we need to think more creatively about transaction taxes, carbon taxes, et cetera. Definitely. And for people who receive stock options as compensation, then it would address that as well. Exactly. And we just got a very timely question, um, which is about the interaction between social security and the debt ceiling. Um, so, uh, Maybe, maybe Tracy or Laura, uh, if one of you uh, feels like you can speak to this, what does it mean for people on these programs to have the debt ceiling pending? Do we like know what happens to people's checks? Um, we're kind of going into the unknown, so I, I don't want to ask you guys about a scenario we've literally never been in before. But but maybe Tracy, do you have any thoughts on on what what this means? Well, I'm sure Laura has a deeper response, but my quick and down and dirty easy response is that when we're not paying for things, it causes chaos. Uh, people end up not getting their checks on time. Administrative services end up being affected. Um, people see the problems that result, even if it's not, you know, like push your check is cut. It's not that. It's that there are delays. There are problems. There are all these different things that make it even harder for people to get the income that they need. And for people who are waiting, for example, for disability determinations about whether they're even eligible for programs, we're slowing that process down even more because we're not funding the agency that is in charge of making those decisions. So it's it's bad, it's not good. Dylan, can I make a, a quick plug? So you Please do, Jason. You mentioned debt ceiling. For anyone who has nothing better to do with their lives, but look at debt ceiling, the Senate Budget Committee tomorrow is having a hearing on the debt ceiling, which I am testifying at 10 a.m. It'll be live. If you just go to Senate Budget Committee hearings, you'll see the page. You can click on it at 10 a.m. We'll talk about Social Security. We'll talk about the House bill, negotiations, what it means for the economy. Mark Zandi is also testifying. So again, if you have nothing better to do with your lives, 10 o'clock tomorrow on debt ceiling, Senate Budget Committee. Well, with a pitch like that, I'm, I'll definitely be there. Um, uh, Laura, did you have anything to add on the debt ceiling? No, just, um, you know, I think the other piece to think about with um, this kind of brinksmanship is that in the past, when we've gone down this road, it has startled the markets. And so if you're concerned about your retirement portfolios, you should be concerned about the brinksmanship about the debt ceiling. Um, we've already seen enough uh, fluctuations in the market for, for my personal comfort level. So uh, I would like it to stabilize and not decline any further. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that they will resolve the impasse and that Jason can convince people tomorrow to uh, have some common sense.
Um, we we have to wrap up pretty soon, but I wanted to end on a point where I think you can you could all agree. Um, it, one takeaway I got from this conversation is social security has a big problem coming up. We need to act and it's better to act sooner than later. Um, maybe we could just go down the line, maybe start with you, Jason. Does that seem right to you? Anything to add to that? It, it, it's definitely right, Dylan. And I've, we've been saying this now for the last 15 years. And so I, I think there has to be more public urgency. Uh, the media has to get involved. Gen Z has got to get involved. Because again, the cost of delay just gets costlier. Laura? Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, I believe that it can and will be fixed long before Gen Z is looking at retirement. Uh, but how we fill that 20 to 25 percent gap is critically important, not just given the needs for today's retirees and, and near retirees, but it's even more important to today's generation that's listening who are not going to have defined benefit pensions, who may not have home ownership. Uh, that Jason alluded to earlier as an asset that they can draw down uh, just because the price of housing has gone so high. Um, so they're going to be relying potentially on Social Security even more. Um, so I, I really want to encourage uh, today's folks from NYU who are students to get more involved in this space, because as we've seen in the past, politicians like to inflict pain not on the, the folks that are retire retiring now, but coming down the pipeline. And so you're going to be firmly in the crosshairs. So please get involved and stay engaged. Tracy, you get the last word. I just wanna echo everything that my fellow panelists have said and just say, you have to care for all the people who are listening. It's so important. If you care about equity, if you care about your own futures, if you care about the futures of the people in your communities, if you care about those things, then this should be one of the important pieces of the work that you do or the things that you care about. If you're going to write into your senator about something, you know, include social security. It's important. And I think your voice is more important than you realize. Um, so just care and, and make this one of your, one of the things on your list. Well, thank you so much to, to all of our panelists. Um, for closing remarks, um, it's my pleasure to welcome Sherry Gleed, who's uh, Dean of the NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Um, Sherry, thank you so much, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Sherry Gleed, I have curly salt and pepper hair. I'm wearing a white top and a camel colored jacket. And I'm sitting on an orange chair with a window shade behind me. Um, thank you, D Dylan. Thank you, panelists. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Wagner is a school of public service, so we have homework for you. Tonight, please go to ssa.gov slash my account and set up an account. You can see your annual earnings history. You can make sure you're getting credited accurately for your earnings. And you can get an estimate of what your social security benefit ought to be when you retire. And after you do it, get one of your friends to do it too. Next, get involved in the debate. Read about the bills being discussed in Congress. Make your preferences known. Changes will be enacted in the next decade and you wanna have a voice in what those changes are. We haven't really had a coalescing moment on social security since 2005. That was really the last time people really paid attention to this issue at a national level. And because of that, there actually aren't many young scholars and analysts and advocates working in this space. So consider working in the field of social security or retirement security after you graduate. Consider applying for a National Academy for Social Insurance Fellowship. In the meantime, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Our recording will be made available immediately on tcf.org and you can learn about future events at tcf.org and at the wagner.nyu.edu website. Good afternoon. <laughs>